Uh, well, I think welcome friends, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, this is a small seminar uh, with uh, a, a very distinguished speaker, uh, Rob Riemann. Uh, there I say he is one of those rare people who is an activist intellectual, who not only is a book lover and who reflects on books and who has, I think, uh, uh, adopted and acted on the greatest humanist values of a common universal tradition that uh, I think everybody around this table adheres to, more or less. But while we sometimes think about it and we sometimes bemoan what we see in society that is not uh, uh, compatible with these values, Rob has done a lot to counter that. Uh, he started out by uh, creating a magazine, the Nexus magazine, with uh, the late Johann Pollack, a uh, good friend of his and the person that I know he admires and uh, values, who passed away in 92. And uh, it was uh, an uh, a journal who, in his own words, uh, was a journal with this era in mind, but not of this time, societally relevant, but not political, with space for the religious and philosophical questions, but not a journal of religion or philosophy. It's quality intellectual, but accessible. So in other words, not too much jargon. Uh, let's keep uh, things clear on ideas. And along with that, he, uh, with his wife, uh, Kirsten Walgreen, in 94, established the Nexus Institute. And uh, that uh, uh, became a, a major center for this kind of progressive humanist thought, both through uh, uh, the seminars and lectures that they do. And the seminar, the, the Nexus lectures are, are famous lectures that uh, uh, brought many uh, uh, distinguished people, starting with the late Edward Said and Amartya Sen and uh, Barenboim and Sonia Gandhi and uh, George Steiner. And I've had the privilege of giving the 2011 uh, Nexus Lecture. Uh, he also is a man who, in his uh, uh, own words from Nobility of Spirit, I, like, I love this passage, uh, that uh, Life as a quest for truth, love, beauty, goodness, and freedom. Life as the art of becoming human through the cultivation of the human soul. Uh, that, of course, is also uh, something that he says about Whitman. Walt Whitman, of course, we have American literature scholars here who recognize that. Uh, but he and I uh, also were discussing a project that is close to his heart and that has been postponed, shall we say postponed? Yeah, 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 sure. Postponed. Um, and he wanted to start a cafe called In Europa, and uh, where the essence of European civilization, as represented by the cafe, which is very different from the American tradition. The idea in Europe is that when you go to a cafe, you sit, you talk, you spend time, you don't go just grab a plastic cup from somebody and drink it in the street as you go out. <laughs> the, the tradition of the cafe, which is closer to us in the Mediterranean anyway, but that these cafes uh, is a place for reflection, discussion, and, and, and socialization, along with uh, uh, a bookstore. And the bookstore would therefore, the topics of the bookstore would become the feeding of the cafe, the cafe would be, enable people to go and sit in the bookstore. And we then started discussing something which is very close to my heart as well, which was how would we select and organize the books that would go into such a bookstore that would epitomize in their essence the uh, meaning of European culture. Now, uh, as Rob said, you know, I would like to be able to put them thematically around ideas 
so that you could put novels next to philosophy, next to poetry, next to something, to the extent that they are connected to each other. And that is something that has been close to my heart. I've talked to Azza about this before. I'm a great admirer of the enormous effort that was done by uh, Hutchins and Adler, uh, who, for those who don't know, uh, were two uh, uh, boy geniuses. Uh, yeah, well, before they went to Chicago, uh, Mortimer Adler was uh, one of the very few people who actually, uh, I think he's probably the only person in North America, who did not get his bachelor's degree, did not get his master's degree, and got his PhD. And uh, so uh, for a variety of reasons, he took all the courses and so on, but uh, uh, in his day, they, for uh, the undergraduate, they had to have physical education, which he refused to take for a variety of reasons. Anyway, so he didn't get the degree, but finally he got his PhD, and he was 27, and then he would go on uh, later on, aside from the great books program which he did with uh, with uh, uh, Hutchins, uh, he would go on to uh, create the Scientopicon, and I'll say a word about that. And then uh, he became the editor of the Encyclopedia Britannica. And he, he was at the Aspen Institute and the Great Ideas Institute and so on. Uh, he was 27 at the time. Now, in the, the same time, Hutchins was uh, not just a full professor, but a dean of the Yale Law School at age 29. And he went on to become president of the University of Chicago at age 30. And uh, so uh, uh, Hutchins and Adler went to Chicago as the dynamic duo or the terrible twins, depending on your perspective. And they got into major fights with the uh, philosophy department where Hutchins placed his friend and protege Adler, uh, because Adler had uh, a perspective on uh, philosophy, uh, which was to go back to the uh, sources. He was a Salafi philosopher. <laughs> he wanted to go back to the sources from, uh, from Aristotle to uh, Aquinas, uh, rather than simply stay with the uh, uh, modern Anglo-Saxon uh, empirical and pragmatic uh, positivist school. And there was a lot of fighting on that. Ultimately, anyway, the books were created. Now, the idea of the great books was uh, about, f they got 528 books, which they considered to be the canon of Western uh, civilization. And they involve uh, literature, philosophy, science, all fields. And they organized them. Uh, and then uh, Adler, with a, a team of about 70, um, fluctuating from 65 to 85 supporters, created for eight years of hard work, he created the Scientopicon. Now, Scientopicon is a two volume uh, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a unique work because he boiled down, after lots of debates, what he considered the essential ideas into 103 ideas. Later on, he would do a TV program which would take 22 of those ideas and discuss them. Ideas like truth and beauty and justice and uh, uh, everything. I mean, 103 of them. And he pointed out that this 103 ideas had existed from a long time because the ancient Greeks had names for every one of those ideas. And that these ideas, of course, had evolved and have been the constant fodder of people thinking, and he tried to organize things around that. So uh, this, in the process of preparing that book, uh, some ideas were split in two. I, sometimes three or four ideas got merged into one. So, but he ended up with 103. And uh, uh, then what he did is that there's an essay at the beginning of the, so the Scientopicon is each of these alphabetically arranged. Uh, starting with uh, Angel and ending with War, I think, uh, A.W. Uh, but uh, the, the, um, uh, the midpoint, surprisingly, is man. So M is, alphabetically, is also the midpoint. But anyway, that's what he ended up with. And there's a discussion, an essay that discusses the idea. And then he lists, in the same edition, of course, because it's the edition of the great books, 
where in the great books this idea is discussed. So Aristotle, uh, which is volume, say, three in his uh, uh, big series, which is 60-volume series, uh, you know, page 104 to 107, so if you take the great books, volume three, and you open 104 to 107, you'll find the discussion of I don't know, the idea of justice, for example, whatever it is. So that is cross-referenced ideas. And my dream had been different, uh, but similar. I wanted very much to uh, uh, do two things. One, you know, of course, that I am reissuing the classics of Islamic uh, uh, thought in the last two centuries. And uh, we are now, uh, Olfat, we've done about 40 volumes? 36. Hmm? 36. 36 volumes, okay. 36 volumes uh, have now been done of this uh, series, which may extend to 100 and some volumes of these works. But I was intrigued, and I went to see my friend at the time, Gabra Asfour, who was in charge of the uh, Egyptian National Translation uh, Center. And I said to him, I wanted to do a series and reissue the global classics, not the, the European classics or the Muslim classics or the Arabic classics. I want to the global classics. And I told him, you probably have a lot of them that have already been uh, translated. I mean, I know, we all know Dostoevsky and uh, Tolstoy has all been translated, Darwin has been translated, all of these things have been translated into Arabic, so I wanted to do new editions of those works. But I wanted uh, to have forwards that would uh, trace and link the ideas between uh, Muslim and Christian, uh, Western and Eastern, uh, uh, Asian, African, Latin American, uh, bring them all together with thoughtful introductions that would weave these things together. Whereupon uh, he said to me, and who's going to write these introductions other than you? And I said, oh, a lot of other people. He said, good, when you find five, come and speak to me. Well, I have found one. <laughs> so far, I have found one. Uh, a person who uh, not only shares my love of books uh, and, uh, and shares my commitment to the uh, ideas of uh, humanism and the values uh, of civilization and civilized discourse, uh, but who's imaginative and gets things done. And uh, as we said, uh, in Europa has just been postponed. So uh, I was very anxious when he came to Alexandria that we would benefit from his reflections about the book and books and civilization. And so, uh, my friends, I ask you all to join me in welcoming Rob Reed. Thank you, Ismail. Um, knowing Ismail makes you realize what friendship is. Um, okay, so yesterday I gave a talk which was, you know, very much political, philosophical about basically the disasters of the, the age in which we are living. Um, today, indeed, I would like to speak um, about, about books, about the quest for uh, a true knowledge. And uh, um, it has to be a very, very personal uh, a talk, uh, because this is what my life is about, as it is, I guess, your life about. I, I can, can only imagine that you speak about these topics in, in a very personal way. And as Dr. Sirak Eldin already mentioned, um, uh, at the end of this talk, or, or the, all my introductionary remarks are made because I want to explain uh, why I have this dream uh, of creating a kind of dream a bookstore uh, um, within the context of a coffee house and a, and, and, and a salon. Uh, um, an idea I had uh, and which I wanted to materialize with my, my best friend, Margit van Veen. She's a bookseller, and, um, and which we could not materialize yet, but again, we, we, we consider it to be postponed. But of course, talking about the bookshop I dream about, the bookstore I dream about, I'm also talking about the library 
I dream about and why, why, and why I think it is essential, why in a certain way we have to restruct um, and reconstruct the kind of knowledge which I think is, uh, is essential. Um, now, again, introductionary remarks. The first one is an anecdote which I would like to share with you. Um, which I once read by the, in the notes of the Austrian poet Hugo von Hofmannsthal, who lived around 1900, he died in 1928, he was a close friend of Thomas Mann, he was the founder of the Salzburger Festspiele, and in 1911 he was told about a, an incident at the Boxer Revolution in China. The Boxer Revolution was a revolution of, of peasants who wanted to fight against the, the growing uh, 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 influence of Western superpowers, and, um, and of course the Germans who, who were there then, they immediately want, want to kill the revolution, and the incident is as follows, that at a certain moment uh, there is a long queue of Chinese peasants waiting to be killed by the guillotine, and a German officer is walking through this line, and at the very end of the line he finds one Chinese reading a book. And he says to this Chinese man, somebody's already shocked. Uh, <laughs> he, says, he says to this uh, 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 Chinese man, he said, why are you reading a book? And the Chinese answers him and says, why are you disturbing me? Don't you see that I'm busy? And the officer says, but how can you possibly read a book now, you know, at this moment? And the Chinese answers him and he says, Every sentence I read is something gained. And this is the note of Hofmannsthal, and then his comment is, this man is the example of the true reader. This is what the true reader is. And for me, for me this, this, this anecdote, this, this unknown Chinese became you know, the prototype, indeed, of the reader. And I thought that you know, if you can read like this in the hour of your death, you're no longer afraid of death you know that something more is important. And he also exemplifies for me the big connection between the art of reading and the art of living. And when more people would understand this connection, we would live in a different world. Um, the second thing I want to mention is that um, there is in German a wonderful word which unfortunately is untranslatable, Bildungserlebnisse. And it's, it's about, you know, profound experiences of life due to something related to, to building, to education. Um, and such a building erlebnis I had when I read The Magic Mountain of Thomas Mann. Because this was the first time I experienced that a book can change your life. There are not many things that can, but, but a book can change your life. And, and for me, it also exemplifies the big difference between amusement and the world of the muses. Because amusement is a wonderful or delightful or exciting way to escape, right? You, you escape from something. But the muses are always that discovery of who you truly are, of who, who, who I am. And so when I read The Magic Mountain, being 18, I realized I am the protagonist of this story. I am the young Hans Castorp. I am as naive, I am as arrogant, I am as uh, 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 full of questions, and, my, and I can only dream of a life in which I can read and have huge conversations, great conversations, realizing that that's a way to mature, you know, to, to grow. And... Um, Reading the Magic Mountain, um, uh, for which, uh, which, which was published in 1924, um, it is known as the last Bildungs novel in Europe because it, 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 it symbolizes uh, uh, the essence of the European spirit in a certain way. Also because the young Hans Gastorp is taught by two teachers, uh, two opponents. One of them is the Italian humanist Settembrini, who is uh, the example of the world of the Enlightenment, uh, that, humani that, that the humanities uh, will, will, will bring goodness, the omnip omnipotence of reason, and that uh, 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 the love of art will, 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 will relate to good deeds. 
His opponent is the Jewish Jesuit communist NAFTA, uh, based on the, no uh, on the model of, of George Lu Lukács. And NAFTA understands much better than Seton Greeny the dark side of the human heart. Um, but he's also in favor of a totalitarian state. He doesn't believe in democracy. He's in favor of absolute obedience. And he's in favor of violence. Thomas Mann, in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a brilliant way, manages you know, to put there together the struggle between the European spirits and the European diamonds. But also he has Hans Kastorp uh, 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 to have a much more fundamental education about the human condition, the human tragedy, that quote-unquote illness and death are part of life and can never be denied. Um, and they do provide a better understanding of of our experience of, 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 of life, but illness and death are also dark powers and should never be allowed to reel our fort for the sake of goodness and love. Um, and according to Thomas Mann, the Magic Mountain basically is a story about the homo day, about men with his religious questions and, and, and realizing that life itself is a quest. So my next step after reading this book was to study theology. Never ever with the idea to become a priest, uh, 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 nor a scholar. I know that the academic world is not my world. But for me, theology, and, and my intuition fortunately was right, is for me essentially an education in the big, but also the cursed questions. Why death? Why illness? Why tragedy? Why evil? It implies the study of philosophy, philology, psychology, uh, comparative religious studies. It's, it's the biggest, the, the best study I know in the world of ideas. But of both all, it's the best education and the best training in reading. There is no form of hermeneutics which has not been thought about in the world of uh, uh, the Talmud, Islamic scholars, uh, 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 the Christian uh, 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 church fathers, etc. And I had the privilege, I managed uh, uh, um, uh, uh, to study this for 10 years. I, uh, I extended, you know, finishing my studies as long as I could. So I, I was there 10 years and, and it felt as if I was, I had created my own magic mountain. I was the young Hans Gastorp and I was basically only reading books, nothing else. Um, and then, Ismail already mentioned him, I met John Pollack. Um, uh, a Jew who survived the war, uh, he became a publisher in Amsterdam, uh, and a man who was highly aware of how vulnerable culture always is. He started the best publishing house, uh, he became the publisher of Elias Canetti, Magritte Jusena, Max Brod, he published the most beautiful editions of, of Dutch classical poetry, etc., etc., etc. He considered the duty of anyone who wanted to be a European to do as the medieval conference did in Europe, collect and study the cultural heritage and to pass it on through the limited channels available. That's why he, this publishing house, the bookshop, and he had also a unique private library. He was a bookman in, 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 in every aspect and he placed his life, thought and work entirely to the surface of the book because Europe and the idea of Europe is through and through connected with the cult of the book. And whilst I also mentioned this in my introduction to the next lecture of uh, 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 Dr. Sera Geldin, uh, he once he wrote a beautiful essay about Alexandria and about his love for this city uh, because of the library, because of Philo of Alexandria, but also because his most beloved poet Kafavis uh, 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 lived here. Uh, and a quote of him, uh, ancient Europe, ancient Egypt must be considered the birthplace of Western culture of writing and books. And of course, he's completely right in that. So the magic mountain, the study of theology and my friendship with this wonderful man became my, my own school of education in European humanism. That's my school of education. This is where I come from, the world of European humanism. And now I would like to, to say a few, first, a few things about European humanism, not in an objective way, I'm not claiming encyclopedic objective knowledge, but I want to explain to you 
how I got to know it, what it means uh, for me. First of all, through John Pollack and his friend George Stein, who became a dear friend of mine as well, I start to understand that European humanism includes a certain intellectual moral code. And this intellectual moral code consists of the following. First of all, the notion that the heart of a culture, is already mentioned it, the heart of a culture is the classic, is the classic, the timeless works. And they are timeless and imperishable because their meaning transcends death. Second, the characteristic of the great works is that they question us. They demand a reaction. There is this wonderful paragraph in one of the letters of Machiavelli, uh, where he mentions that, that after, uh, he's in exile, uh, he's in trouble, uh, 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 at daytime he goes uh, 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 to the fields, uh, uh, um, to the cafe, uh, he speaks with all kinds of people, but he says, at night, I you know, I take a bath, I put on my most beautiful uh, clothes, and I enter my library, and for four hours I'll start the conversations with those who know much better than I do. And this is the most beautiful uh, uh, description of what it means to read in your own study. So the, the great works, they question us. They, they ask us, what are you doing? What, are, what is that you're knowing? Why do you think what you think? The third part of the moral code is do not shy away from what is difficult. Spinoza, all things excellent are as difficult as they are rare. I mean, one of the diseases we are dealing with now, at least in Western society, is that everything has to be easy and fun, etc., etc. It's, it's a curse. The fourth part of the moral code is that only fools ignore the, the significance of tradition and fact. Uh, and knowledge. And there is a wonderful quote of Hölderlin who, who, who said, you know, um, you're only original uh, when, you, when there is nothing you know. Then you think you're original. I mean, to be original is, is fool's knowledge. Um, being a critic means being able to make distinctions. Part of the moral code is that you have to be at home in the world of culture. But being at home in the world of culture means at home in many worlds, many languages. Being at home in history of ideas, in literature, music, art, it, it requires erudition and the ability to see the connections between the various worlds. Also part of the code is there is always a connection between language and politics, between culture and society. And in order to understand cultural developments, to see which ideas prevail and what the consequences will be, cultural philosophical reflection is indispensable. And last but not least, and this is a controversial point, at least in my part of the world, but still there is, it is essential to be elitist. It is essential to be elitist, but in the original sense of the word, to take responsibility for the best of the human mind. A cultural elite must bear the responsibility for the knowledge and preservation of the most important ideas and values, for the classics, for the meaning of words, for the nobility of our spirit. Being elitist, as Goethe explained, means being respectful, respectful for the divine, of nature, of our fellow human beings, and so for our own human dignity. So that was my first big lesson. There is a kind of intellectual moral code which you have to embrace and which you have to incarnate if you want to be part of the world of European humanism. But next to this moral code is the awareness that the book, by definition, is more important than money. If this would have been understood now, if this would be understood in America, in Europe, in whatever, we would live in a complete different world. Um, there is almost an ontological difference. And for me, it's best described in one of the letters of Vincent van Gogh, the great Dutch painter, uh, to his beloved brother, Theo. I quote, it's, it's a small quote. Theo writes to Theo the following. Dear brother, there are things that are as old as mankind itself and that won't 
seas for the present. I know an old legend of, I don't even know which people, which I like, which obvious, obviously certainly didn't happen literally, but is nonetheless a symbol of a great deal. The story goes that humankind is descended from two brothers. These folk were allowed to choose what of all things they wanted to have. One chose the gold and the other chose the book. Everything went well for the first one who had chosen the gold, but things went badly with the second. The legend, without explaining exactly why, relates how the man with the book was banished to a cold and miserable land and isolated. But then in his misery, he began to read that book and he learned things from it. So that he was able to make life more bearable for himself and invented different things to rescue himself from his difficulties. So that at last he had quite a certain control, although always by working and as if through a struggle. Then later, just as the one with the book became stronger, the first one weakened. And so he lived long enough to feel that gold isn't the axis around which everything resolves. It's only a legend, but all the same to me there is something deep in it that I find true. The book that isn't only all books or literature, it's also conscience, reason, and it is art. Gold that isn't only money, but it is an image of a lot of other things as well. This is part of the letters of Vincent van Gogh, and I think it's, it should be in the Constitution. <laughs> okay, um, my third lesson was that art, literature, and poetry, the gifts of the muses, are essential as a man without imagination is a dead soul. Uh, yesterday we had briefly a, a discussion about the role of imagination, about this, 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 this optimistic view that the world of literature, that the world of, 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 of arts uh, um, can turn people into better people. That obviously is nonsense. There is no pill, there is no shortcut to, to become a better human being. But I'm deeply convinced that without it, you don't have a chance. With it, at least you have a chance. And so to be able to understand and to express our inner life and to know the secrets, your own secrets of your heart and to able and to understand and express all that is beyond reason, we do need the language of the muses. Art literature helps us to see the world through the eyes of another and being able to imagine the experience and emotions of another, we can have compassion. It's not a rule, but when you are able to have compassion, art can help enormously. And so this is why I, I totally agree with Marcel Proust when he writes at the end of his wonderful A la richesse de ton pédou, I quote, real life, life finally uncovered and clarified, the only life in consequence lived to the full is literature. Last but not least, I learned what the Greek philosopher Socrates taught me. As you know, the predecessors of Socrates, the first philosophers, were mainly interested in physics, the laws of the universe, and wanted to know what being is. But Socrates broke with that tradition as he was only interested in one thing, man. What's the human being all about? And he asked himself, what defines the human being? And the answer this is in the dialogue uh, uh, with Alcibiades. His answer is, it's the human soul. It's the human soul that defines the human being. And so, according to Socrates, we have to devote our life to cultivate our soul. How? Well, first of all, the two big questions. What is the just way to live? What is a good society? Secondly, to realize that man is that creation, that creature with a double nature. Yet all of us, on the one hand, you know, we are made of blood, flesh, we have our instincts, drift, needs, etc. But we are also always a spiritual being. 
We know about eternal values. We know about freedom. We know about truth. We know about beauty. We know about friendship. Thirdly, life is not about who you are, but who you should be. This is part of the double nature thing. We know what we are, but the question you have to ask yourself is, how, what's the person you should be? It is about, this is an expression of George Stein, about a homecoming to your better self, the, dignitas, the dignity of life. And fourth, to achieve that we are in need and realize of a lifelong spiritual and cultural form of education, through which one can grow from an individual to a personality. This is what Socrates calls paideia, bildung. Because as individuals, as mentioned, we are this human composite of urge, needs, desires, and will accept everything as long as it is present, useful, or profitable. But the person of character, a true personality, on the contrary, is an individual who has become conscious of the fact that everyone carries a spiritual principle in him, the image of a true being. And that's the thing we have to adopt and to make it concrete by this education. Now, the education Socrates champions, it's not, the knowledge is not an unambiguous. It does not allow itself to be defined. It is not in a handbook. You cannot Google it or download it. That's impossible. It is not a science. It is ultimately heart knowledge. And thanks to this spiritual education, we can develop the intuition for what is good and what's not. We can cultivate our understanding by asking the right questions and being critical, but also by keeping our senses open to the poetry of life, the hidden, modest beauty that is everywhere. Paideia is an exercise in justice, but also the capacity to phantom another's heart and to hear the unspoken and be able to express one's own feeling. Um, this is Socrates' ideal of knowledge. But, next question. All questions are always logical. How do we know what is true? How do we know it? How, how can we possibly know what when something is truthful. So, you know, if, 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 you, if you're striving for truthful knowledge, we have to know what is truthful. And in the work of Socrates, I found the following answer, which on the one hand is, is was amazing for me, but I think it's profoundly true. Because what Socrates teaches us again and again and again is that we find ourselves confronted with death and loss. And only in this confrontation with death and loss, which is things we cannot escape from, you can learn what is truly meaningful and has value. Why? Because we mortal human beings, we are surrounded by the transitory and we have everything to lose. We can lose our home, our jobs, our friendships, our health, our children, our loved ones and our trusts. Basically, life is the experience of loss. And sooner or later, no one will escape from it. But it is exactly an experience of this pain and regret that the human soul wishes to elevate itself, fly up like a dove, and find something that remains, that can and will remain and that will not be lost. <coughs> and where the human soul experiences exactly this, there is this miraculous, often inexpressible experience of congeniality of souls. And it happens to you when you find a true friend, or when you experience that love indeed is as strong as death. But it can also by becoming aware of beauty, or being touched by that one work of art in which you recognize your own soul, and you are absolutely certain this will remain. Why? For exactly the same reason that you still can be found moved by music of Beethoven, or uh, uh, when you still, you know, fell, fell silent when you see uh, Michelangelo's Pieta, 
or whether you recognize your own emotions in a novel of uh, 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 Jane Austen. Because all these works of art, they speak to you. And they have something to say because there is a certain life force in them. Because what is death is silent. Everybody who knows and experiences death know what death is. It's eternal silence. But what lives, what lives, that always speaks. And what speaks, that lives. And it lives because it is true and has meaning and therefore has a power of expression. What is not true is without meaning, has no power of expression and will be silent. Only truth gives life. Since no life, no language, no feeling can be based on lies or what is in fact meaningless. And this is why only true friendship, true love, true beauty and true art can remain. And every human being, I'm so deeply convinced about that, you know, has this quality and realizes what quality is. Everybody knows who's your true friend, who's your true love, and, and why you keep on reading a certain poet and why you keep on listening to certain music. Because there's an eternal life in it. Now, the understanding of what is good and what has quality also helps us to understand what European humanism considers to be the best. Because all th if all that is good lives, then the best is that which, which gives life to the living. It is like in art, a good work remains, but the best art, the art that will become a classic, is the work that has a lasting effect and that determines a realm of ideas and calls forth all arts, gives life and soul. I mean, you, I mean, the, you know, listen, and, 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 and the Ilias has been told again and again and again. Antigone has been told again and again and again. Uh, um, it, all, all the main stories will, ever, will always be told again and again and again. Now, in the same way, European humanism finds what is best in a meaningful existence that makes men great, in his speaking and acting based on a grammar of life. Freedom and truth, friendship and loyalty, Wisdom and courage, love and poetry, justice and harmony form the basic grammar of our existence. And these are the qualities that give life, that inspire. They have the capacity to make the meaningless meaningful and to transform the transitory into the intransitory, that what remains. And it is in these words that we see the image of who we should be that we are confronted with the standard by which our own lives are measured. And in the mirror of our true identity, wealth, fame, power, no longer matter, um, the only one question is asked, are you cultivating your soul and are you living truthfully? Now, dear friends, this is what I got to know, all of this, in this period of 10 years, during my studies, my friendship, uh, 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 and, and, and the works of of Thomas Mann and, and, and the, in the intellectual landscape of Thomas Mann. Um, it's probably important to stress that this humanism I'm talking about is not anti-religious. The opposite is true, as it has deep, deep religious roots, as it recognizes that man is a religious being and uh, uh, who knows about absolute universal values that life is sacred and that's our responsibility to live in truth, to do justice and to create beauty and make our own life meaningful. There is the awareness with Pascal that, quote unquote, the heart has its reasons, which reasons doesn't understand. And with Thomas Mann that we have to accept that we are here to ask profound questions which will never find a definitive answer. This humanism will not separate culture and politics as it realizes that aesthetics, ethics and politics together are part of our humanity. And there is always uh, the period in life in which you are tested and at the end of my 10 years of education most unfortunately uh, my beloved elder brother died unexpectedly and my, my, my teacher and my master uh, Jan Palak, he died as well. And, and then I had to realize and I had to put in practice all the lessons I had learned those years. Now, in 1921, 
when Thomas Mann was at the end of this process in which he had to transform from a very conservative nationalist thinker into the great European humanist he became, uh, he asked himself this question in a great essay, Goethe und Tolstoy. He asked the question, I quote, is the Mediterranean classic humanist tradition a legacy of all mankind and therefore of eternal value or is it just part of a certain period, a certain class, the liberal bourgeoisie, and will it disappear with them? This was his big, big question in 1921. And all the novels he wrote after him, Joseph and his brothers, Dr. Faustus, his novel on Goethe, are all about this. This is the key question. European humanism, I've been talking about, my school of educa education, does it belong to a world of yesterday, which is indeed a world of beautiful private libraries and chamber music, but also with sexual repression, poverty, racism, anti-Semitism, colonialism, or is it indeed the expression of a timeless, universal ideal of civilization because it offers freedom and dignity to all human beings? Now, the fact is, as, as we are all aware, this European humanism with its culture of books uh, and quest for true knowledge is no longer part of our time. Uh, we live in the age of science, um, but most people do not realize how right Wittgenstein is with his important observation, I quote from the Tractatus, we feel that even if all possible scientific questions were answered, the problems of life would still not have been touched at all. This is also the age of politicization. You know all about that. This is the age of fundamentalism, of people who act as if they are God himself or herself. This is the age of capitalism, and I talked yesterday about the age of kids. We have become God crazy, money crazy, technologically, te technologically crazy. And the consequences of our societies are obvious. Um, I will skip now a wonderful, because it will take too long, but there is a wonderful quote of Pessoa in, in the book of Disquiet, uh, in which he reflects of how we came through this uh, uh, loss. But that's, that's for another time or, or for later. The, the question, our question, which I would like to share with you is, you know, what's to be done? What's to be done? Now, um, a, I think there is a lot to be done and should be done. Secondly, um, we all, for the first thing we have to realize is that pessimism is by definition useless. It, de it deprives of energy and it, it will not lead to anything. Second, we have to realize, this, re to realize that renaissances are always possible and have been possible and will be possible. And the good news is they always start with a few good men and women who are able to make the difference. I just uh, uh, mentioned to, to Dr. Asa that, that John Pollack always, uh, uh, you know, when we talked about many things and, and when I was in despair, etc., etc., he consoled me with the remark. He said, Rob, you're a Christian. Do you really forget that Christianity started with only 12 men and we are already with 20, right? I mean, there's not much more you need. Okay, we are approximately with 20. Um, Stephen Greenblatt recently wrote a wonderful book, The Swerve, where he tells in a very exciting way uh, uh, how, how one book hunter, one humanist, found the last copy of uh, 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 Lucretius uh, uh, on, on the nature of things, and, and with finding this copy and copying it by hand many, many times and spreading this work, you know, the, the, the whole renaissance started, you know, a, a transformation of, of thinking, a real transformation of, of, of a mindset. Books can, still can change and will be able to change society. Um, okay. And last point in this uh, 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 part. Uh, I am convinced of the fact that many, many people are open for change. But they do need the instruments. And the instruments are no longer there because, quote-unquote, 
the universities are, 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 are horrible and and we are imprisoned in, 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 in the paradigm of a, a rational technological capitalist society. Um, so when I discussed all these things with my friend John Pollack, we came with the idea to start a journal, a journal for European culture called uh, 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 Nexus. And the, the whole idea behind it was that we wanted to achieve, basically we wanted to return to the original idea of a university and also the original idea of a library, what a library is all about. And um, there is an, 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 uh, 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 and what, what we realized is that we need again institutions. We need again a kind of education through universities, through libraries, where quote unquote, we can find the best knowledge about the most important topics. And we gave our journal, we gave our institute a motto seeing meaning and seeing connections. You can only understand things when you see the meaning, when you are able to make the connections. And th the problem of, of our time is that being imprisoned by this rationalist, technological, capitalist paradigm, in a certain way we are still imprisoned when it comes down to knowledge in the paradigm of Descartes. Descartes is the man of subject, object, science, specializations, etc., etc. And what is it that we are doing? Our universities, you can study uh, uh, A, B, C, D, X, Y, Z, and there are no connections. And at the library, you can go to the shelf of economics or history or, or, or archaeology, etc., 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 and it's the same paradigm. We still are not able to make the connections. The funny part of this is when, 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 when we had the journal uh, out and, and of course we needed subscriptions, we sent it to all libraries of all universities and all libraries of all universities in the Netherlands refused to take a subscription. This was surprising. So I phoned them, I said, you know, why? You know, what's the problem? And they said, well, we do not know where to put it. And as we do not know where to put this, we, we do not know who will pay for it. Because history will say, no, no, this is not a journal for history. And philosophy will say, no, no, this is not a journal for philosophy. And theology will say, no, no, this is not a journal. So, this is, you know, the, 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 the intellectual disaster about behind those uh, uh, institutions. So this is why I, I, I got the idea, going back to the world of Vico, who was, you know, the main intellectual opponent to the thinking of Descartes, we have to be able to make the connections again. So my idea was and is, and I, I, I'm working on it, to have it materialize that bookstores and libraries, and, and, and I know you, you, you need an intellectual organization to get it done, but, but we, we can organize these things. No longer stick to the paradigm of the cut. But let's, let's first of all reflect on what are the big topics? What are the, what are the main questions? And so I had mentioned, well, there is always war and peace. There is always this question of know thyself. There is always uh, the cursed questions on illness, death, and tragedy. And then, indeed, next to each other, we will put there the classics about a certain theme, but also the novels about it, and poetry about it, and then history books about it, and then art books related to it, and the best new books, uh, which are also related to that. So if, for example, Money and power. Yes, we will have the books of Joe Stieglitz and, and, and Paul Krugman, uh, but I also want to have Marx and, 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 and Keynes and, and Adam Smith. I want to have the novels of Balzac and Sola, uh, but also uh, uh, if you really start to understand what the problem with this financial world is, it is, it is a macho culture. It's the biggest ape. And so next to this, I also want to have the books of the world of, 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 of psychology about macho behavior. So that, that the, when, when, when people, you, you don't try to find a book on economics, no, you want to know something about, more about you know, the financial crisis and then you open up a certain world. Anyway, listen, this is all, all for our discussion, but the, the whole thing, the point I want to make is that we intellectuals 
privileged human beings we are, we have a task to fulfill. And the task to fulfill is to be a guide. Not telling people, you have to believe this, you have to do that, or whatever, but to be a guide, to open up worlds, but to open up worlds in such a way that people finally, beyond the explanation, can find a certain understanding. And the understanding can only happen when you, you know, when you are able to make the connections. And, an, 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 and just sticking to the paradigm of, of Descartes, and, 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 and that, that will not lead to anything. I apologize for being so long, but this is all I had to say. Thank you very much, Rob. And before we uh, uh, start our discussions, I would urge everybody, we'll take a brief break, take your coffees, chat, get to know each other a little bit, and then bring back a second a cup of coffee here so we can have a good discussion. Not quite a coffee shop, but uh, <laughs> close. It's a good shop. But, but close. So uh, let us take a brief uh, break and have some coffee. Thank you. Welcome everybody for the next hour of discussion and I would urge that we um, first uh, introduce uh, uh, ourselves, uh, go around the table because many of you know each other but Professor Riemann doesn't know you and uh, we can start with uh, Nagla Wagag over there who is a wonderful person, among other things, uh, you may not know this about me but I have a special book about Shakespeare of which I'm very proud. And uh, I was very dubious when my friend Gabar Asfur told me that he was going to have it translated into Arabic. I said, Shakespeare into Arabic? Well, I suppose it's been translated to every language, but my essay on Shakespeare? And he said yes. And he entrusted Nagla to do it, and she did an absolutely marvelous job. And that was my first introduction to Nagla. So please, Nagla, introduce yourself. Then, Azza, we go this way and that way, and then we come back to the discussion. So please, quick introduction as we go along. Oh, thank you very much, Dr. Slagadzin, for the very wonderful introduction. Uh, I'm Nagla Abouageg, Associate Professor at the English Department, uh, Faculty of Arts at Alexandria University. And uh, I'm honored to be here. Thank you. OK, as a Huli, I work uh, for the Library of Alexandria, but I'm also a professor uh, in the English Department of Alexandria University. And uh, two places from the left is one of my bosses, and Dr. Saragiddin is my boss. So I am sitting here, and it's two bosses. So you can imagine, Professor Riemann, how you know a bit tense I am. Hassan Saadi, professor of uh, ancient Egyptian uh, civilization and ancient Near East uh, civilization as well. Um, head of Department of History and Archaeology, Faculty of Arts, uh, University of Alexandria. And I'm really uh, so proud to be among these uh, eminent uh, colleagues, and uh, especially uh, you and uh, Professor Ismail Sragiddin. And uh, hopefully, uh, the, the, this uh, meeting will be very fruitful uh, in the way you started uh, dealing with the uh, that important topic. Thanks very much. Uh, my name is Fethi Abouayana, a professor of human geography in Alexandria University and uh, ex-vice president of Alexandria University too, and ex-president of Beirut Arab University in Lebanon. And uh, I'm so happy to be here, and I always feel happy with Dr. Spice Ragdeen and with a distinguished groups working with him in this library. Because we in uh, Alexandria as a whole look to this library as the center of enlightenment of the society as a whole. And uh, we are doing our best uh, to uh, find fields of uh, support uh, from the social society and from the university to be always here and linked to this uh, marvelous library. And so happy to be with you, Professor Rob, because you are now giving us a very important lecture. It's a sort of philosophy and the theology and the culture. And uh, Dr. Ismail, when he introduced you, saying that you are an intellectual activist now, I'm sure that you are an intellectual activist. Thank you. 
Uh, I'm Sahar Hamoud. I think I'm the last person in this room to belong to Alexandra University. I'm also a professor of English literature at Alexandria University, and I also work in the Library of Alexandria uh, at the Alexandria and Mediterranean Research Center. And the classics and uh, there's also another center, yes, called the uh, Center for Hellenistic Studies, which is a joint project between the Library of Alexandria and Alexandria University. It's Alexandria University which grants the degrees. The library is not a grant, uh, uh, is not a degree granting body, and it uh, gives MAs and diplomas, and in future, hopefully, PhDs are Hellenistic studies because, of course, this is the added value of being in Alexandria. My name is Huda Al-Miqati. I head the Science Center here at the Library of Alexandria. Uh, my primary interest in is uh, science communication to the public and uh, uh, informal science education and communication of science to the public. And um, it is interesting, I think, that the World Bank has issued, a, uh, I like very much, a graph uh, showing that uh, in our lifetime, uh, from birth till uh, retirement, we spend only 18%, 18.5% of our time in formal education system. The rest of, an, uh, of our uh, lifespan is, uh, um, is um, uh, that we are uh, subjected to informal uh, environments like in uh, libraries, in the media, in the different environments. And uh, this is where I think that we get and we, uh, we mold the identity of, uh, uh, of uh, the youth and uh, of people. And uh, that's why I'm very interested in informal uh, education, especially science. My name is Amir Wasif. I'm an industrialist from the Borgar Arab area near Alexandria and uh, also a founding member of the Egypt-Japan University of Science and Technology. So I'm really wearing two hats here. Uh, I am going to pick your brain regarding your comments and dissatisfaction with the current system of universities. I would like you to elaborate more on that later. So uh, this is a very interesting comment that I would like to, uh, to clarify. Thank you. Uh, my name is Sara Surur. I'm working as a coordinator for the Library of Alexandria, the Public Relations and International Contact Department. I'm here at the library. I work since 10 years or even more. I attended the uh, inauguration of the library. I'm always uh, very, very proud to have Dr. Sarag Din around the library. <laughs> and <laughs> I feel great because the chance put me in this uh, such a, a great uh, place with a great family. All of them uh, here are like my family and more, and I'm proud. Thank you. I'm Lamia Abdel Fateh. Um, I'm a librarian. I'm heading the library uh, sector, acting as uh, chief librarian. Um, it, give, it gives me really great pleasure to be here with you and to hear, as a librarian, I'm fascinated about what he talked about, about the books and, and the value of the book, and that's more important than the money. It's, I'm really fascinated about all this. It's very interesting. Thank you, sir. So, I'm also Gafur. I'm a publishing consultant and part of Dr. Ismail Sarigdin's office. And I'm a lover of books. And uh, I mean, all your, your lecture or presentation is very interesting and it gives us to think of all these different links. Thank and, you. And former director of the publications department of the Library of Alexandria as well, <laughs> founding director of the department as well, <laughs> consultant now, but before that was founding. I am Noha Omar. I work for the Library of Alexandria since 10 years uh, for the publishing department as deputy director with a still director, Ms. Olfad Gafur. My name is Fadma Aymer and I work for the CGSPS, the Center for Democracy and Social Peace Studies. Um, well, I have a background in literature since I am um, I graduated in the Faculty of Arts French Department. Um, well, that's all I can say. I enjoy working in the library. I've been working here for around like nine years or even more now. 
So, and thank you for the chance. I'm Heidi. I'm Heidi. Uh, I'm a specialist in the public relations and international context department. Uh, I'm proud to be one of the uh, lovely family here in the library. I work for five years and I'm graduated from business administration uh, at Arab Academy for Science and Technology. Thank you. Uh, I think we've uh, just been exposed, of course, to uh, uh, Rob Bremen's uh, universalism, uh, breadth and, and depth of reflection on, on uh, all that's going on. I have uh, three observations to make, and I'll leave uh, this to, to uh, further discussion. Uh, the first is whether the, the uh, intellectual is a guide or someone who simply helps set the stage and allows people to find their own way, including getting lost if they want to. And I felt, and I told Rob this, I wrote an essay 25 years ago or more called Mirrors and Windows. And I felt that the, the, the role of intellectuals was to create mirrors in which we see ourselves. We see ourselves either as victims or we see ourselves as the the ch chosen people, we see ourselves as the instrument of God on earth, we see ourselves as uh, whatever we see ourselves as. And then secondly, that they also create windows through which we see the world and we can see the world as a place that is full of conspiracies and danger or a place that is full of opportunity, a place of beauty or a place of uh, ugliness and threats. Um, and these mirrors and windows help each person define uh, how they see themselves in the world and how they relate to others in that world. And thus, they help us redefine the boundaries and the mind in which the us ends and the them begins. The second observation is one that comes from my friend, the late uh, Burstein, uh, Daniel Burstein, who was the former Librarian of Congress before Jim Billington, uh, who passed away. And he said a very beautiful phrase that uh, we are all questers. Uh, in other words, we are searching all our lives, whether it is in science or, or in philosophy or not. And that, um, therefore, in many ways, I would guess uh, that the, it is the fecundity of the questions that is more important than the finality of the answers, because there are no answers. I mean, there's no final answer to any question. It shall be re-asked and so on. And the greatness um, of the classics, and that's the point that Rob made, is that they ask you questions. And these are very fecund questions. They are questions that every person, every generation keeps asking, and keeps finding new answers for. And thus, uh, the search for a finality of answers, I think, is, is mistaken, including in science. Because if we had the final answer in science, there would be no more scientific progress. So we all expect the scientific paradigm to be overthrown and new paradigms to emerge. And our respect for Newton is not diminished by the fact that Einstein created a new perspective on the cosmos. And our respect for Einstein will not be diminished by whoever will come back and explain the remaining 96% of the universe, which cannot be explained on the current theory. So uh, there is no finality of the answer. The third point I'd like to make is that we Today, we limit ourselves, of course, to discussions of uh, uh, European culture. But in the early sketch I gave at the beginning is uh, uh, this library should aspire to be a universal library. And thus, uh, we should not make the mistake of saying that it is only on both sides of the Mediterranean that this dialogue has to be expanded. Regretfully, most people know very little about, I was telling my colleagues during the coffee break, about such things as Korean culture, Japanese culture, Chinese culture, Indian culture. Very little compared to what we know about European culture, about Muslim culture, Iranian culture, Even the and well, African culture, uh, Latin American culture, etc. But I used the, the Far East because these are long historical traditions. I mean, uh, all the examples I've given. I'm told by philologists, I can't vouch for it, but I'm told by philologists that the Korean language is the most perfect language in the sense of the correspondence 
of the symbols to the sounds in the language, so you don't have to make up the sounds uh, with com composite uh, letters like CH and SH and so on. They're the, 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 the correspondence is apparently the best. And uh, it's been around for 800 years, this new alphabetical structure that exists there. But that was, of course, built on a long culture that preceded it. And even the pre-Columbian culture is now beginning to yield. It's, it's not so. To, we, we have had a, a strong Eurocentric tradition because Europe has dominated the world for the last uh, 500 years. Uh, dominate, dominated completely. Uh, America is born of the colonies of the Europeans in North America. Uh, the Iberian uh, uh, invasion of Latin America has transformed the Latin American continent, has replaced many of the cultures that exist there with new cultures. And uh, they are different from the, 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 the uh, Spanish and Portuguese cultures that remain in Europe because they are Latin American and they have their own contributions, but they're still also linked with Europe. But if you go beyond that to the Far East and to uh, South Asia, uh, we have cultures uh, that we know little about, but surprisingly, our Muslim forefathers knew a lot about. They were very open to these cultures. They brought the numerals from India and the zero from India and gave it to Europe, and they were very open on this interaction that existed. And we should do no less. But we would do a lot, I think, just by learning first uh, how European culture can transcend its own challenges and then how we can link European and Muslim culture and then expand. And my question to Rob is, is it better to start with both sides of the Mediterranean and then expand to the rest of the world? Or should we start from the beginning with a systematic effort to include these other cultures of the world as an essential part to constructing the platform on which we want to build this universal approach. Well, <coughs> you should not argue in general, um, I think, with God. Um, but if I would have a chance to argue with him, I would complain about the fact there are only 24 hours uh, in a day, <laughs> which I think is a basic mistake. Um, you know, serious, how much time do we have? Because time demands that we create priorities. Time is only about priorities. Um, the, the second thing is there is this, uh, and it will be, it, it, it's a universal uh, 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 knowledge, but I got it from the, from the Talmud, uh, where it's written, when you try to do everything, you end up with doing nothing. We, we cannot impossibly, we cannot possibly do everything. So I, I would, I would, my, my preference would be, you know, let's, let's find a starting point and work from there and then spread instead of try to include everything from, 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 from scratch. But, but that's, that's a very practical uh, uh, thing. Now, uh, talking about uh, or thinking about then, 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 then what to be done in, in very practical uh, terms, um, you know, just a few things from you know, loud thinking. First of all, we have to question ourselves. Why is it that we keep on uh, uh, working within a certain paradigm? When is it that we start to question the paradigm in which we are working? Why is it that we keep on structuring the universities and the libraries and the bookstores as they are? That's one thing. Second thing, an essential, the, 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 the anchor of the paradigm we are, we are dealing with is that everything has to be useful. Why? Why? Where on earth is written that everything we have to do, have to do is useful? Well, well, you know, five minutes of thinking will make us clear that, as I mentioned yesterday, the most important things are not useful. So if we are totally focused on what's useful, we forget to live. Now, my third point. I mentioned yesterday, uh, uh, I, I talked a lot about Nietzsche. Nietzsche, when he, he was just professor of philology in Basel, and uh, there was uh, the students' organization who thought, well, this is interesting, you know, the, the young professor with the big moustache, uh, 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 shall we ask him to speak about the future of education? Talking about the future of education is as old as education, probably. 
So Nietzsche was also invited, you know, by, by, by those youngsters, can you talk about the future of education? And Nietzsche said, well, you know, yes. And, uh, uh, and so he, he, five lectures, which in the end he never published, they were, they were published after his death. But, but uh, present were Jacob Burkhardt, the great historian, Wagner came, you know, it was, it was, it was a big show off. And Nietzsche was a little bit nervous, but he said, okay, let's. So he invented the story. And basically his message was um, that education already 140 40 years ago is a mess. Why is it a mess? He says, well, the gymnasium is no longer what it used to be, and the universities are fooling everybody who's going to the universities. Why? He says, because whole education is now centered on one question, how to make money. And so you get this part of culture, which is just enough you know, to make sure that you're not a complete idiot, but also not too much because otherwise, you know, you can, you can spend your time much better than it. So he says the whole purpose of education is to, to do what the state wants and what's good for the economy. Quote, quote Nietzsche 144 years ago. We didn't make any progress. Everything got only worse. My second example to illustrate this point as I mentioned to uh, 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 the professor, the um, education in America is even worse than it is in Europe. It, it, it is a complete organized disaster. Yet there are still top universities, Harvard, Princeton, Yale, Stanford. Now, not that long ago, to be sure, uh, 2010, when, when the whole financial crisis had uh, had become clear, and, and, and when, 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 we, when we got to know what happened, you could, you could just you know, follow the track and see who were the people directly involved, directly responsible. And if you then Google them, you'll find out that all of them, all of them are educated by the Harvard Law School and the Yale Law School. <laughs> now, due to my work, I happen to know both presidents, Drew Faust and Rick Leffert. So I sent him an email and said, look, both of you are making big advertisement. We are Harvard. We are Yale. We educate the future leaders of the world. I said, well, here are the facts. Thank you very much. What's going wrong with your education? I never got a reply. But Nietzsche is still right. Because the, whole, the purpose of the Harvard Law School and the Yale Law School is how to make money. It's nothing more than that. And they don't know anything. All those people are completely ignorant. Illiteracy. Listen, you, you cannot you, the, the, try to have a conversation about a book, a literature, with a prominent American politician. It is impossible. It is impossible. So what is it that we can do? Well, I think that there's an, an you know, we have to show some courage. And, this, and, and I think that, that, that let's have this in-depth discussion. If we talk about knowledge and true knowledge, what are we talking about? How can we organize it? An, 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 what is it that, that, that we think, you know, if we now would speak with, with Adler, and, and, and what is it that, that and they would, would sit around the table here? You know, what is now considered to be key knowledge, the, the great books? Given the fact that we are in the time of Facebook, uh, uh, Twitter, uh, uh, Amazon, etc., 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 and then you know, let, let's have a start. S -s let's start the bookshop of. Let's start to reconstruct part of the library, etc., etc., and and then you know, make it clear. What is open? Thanks very much. What uh, you have touched slightly uh, during your uh, talk uh, in the uh, first session, that uh, a certain conversations uh, should be done between the person and the uh, titles of the library in general. And that reminds me with uh, what I always say to my students, that you have to make a sort of conversation with the titles of each bibliography uh, in, in the books, you know. So um, um, in, in that way, uh, do, do you think that uh, the, uh, what, what you are talking about, uh, the, uh, uh, the globalization, you know, or to, to, to put people all together in one track, if that would work, 
do you think that any items we have to set first to make this sort of conversation in a global way? Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. Um, well, A, um, questions whether we are in Korea or in Africa or here or in Europe or in America, the, the, the questions related to the human condition are all the same. Secondly, um, as we are now living in this global world and we are 24 hours a day informed whether it's through Al Jazeera or CNN about what's going on on the globe um, and because the financial world is a global phenomenon. Um, many, there are many issues, not all of them, but there are many issues which are, which became global issues. The financial crisis is now, is now a global issue. Um, so, just, an, an, an just again, you know, trying to, to be uh, 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 creative. One of the things we could imagine, we could imagine, is that we use the, 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 the uh, uh, nowadays technology, um, you know, to build kind of intellectual global community uh, and find out, you know, this, this first thing, you know, That, 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 we, that, we, that we get everybody's input on what the big questions and issues are, and then maybe and now when I, I'm, I'm rethinking about my, about my initial answer, it is very well possible if we if we if we if we mention the whole notion of war and peace. Well, of course, you know everybody should read uh, uh, Tolstoy. There is much more to be read, but if you then next to this put you know, the classics of Hellenistic culture and what the Chinese have to say about it, etc., etc., etc. And it's very well possible, you know, that, 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 that we can build, you know, with, with publishers and intellectuals in Korea and, and other parts of the world, you know, that, that we can start constructing uh, uh, um, from, a, from a huge variety of parts of the world, you know, which books should be there. Because this is also one of the reasons why, why I came up with the idea, and that's the lie of Amazon. And the lie of Amazon is that um, there are several lies. First of all, it is about information, it's not about knowledge. And when you have, uh, 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 and, and when, when you order books X, they tell you, well, other people also like that, da, 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 but that's a completely different concept. Um, th 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 that's, that's more the world of amusement, that's, that's more trying, you know, to, 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 to remain close to uh, uh, what you are already thinking instead of confronting yourself, you know, with all the things you should know. Then we also know that Amazon, I mean, in, 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 in American journals, uh, uh, there has been now many essays uh, about it and they, even publishers went, 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 went to court because Amazon is selling the books below the cost price, because Amazon wants to destruct publishing houses. Amazon already has now around 100 and 150 writers who can write books based on uh, the interest of their clients. I mean, this is, this is kitsch, right? It was, and we can sell you the book, you know, what completely fulfills, you know, what you already have been dreaming about, etc., etc., etc. So Amazon is not interested in books. Amazon is not interested in, in, to, 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 in the survival of book culture. It's against it. And so there's an... Amazon is a retailer. Pardon? Amazon is a retailer. They sell clothes, they sell electronics, they sell, it's a retailer. I mean, as far as they're concerned, they're making money. Uh, yeah, no, no, there's an, 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 no, no, but look, look, there's an, if, look, there's an, Okay, part of our uh, 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 problems is that uh, uh, um, books and for books, well, you know, they used to be publishing houses. And, and, but publishing houses were important because when you went to the old-fashioned European publishing houses, Fischer, Suhlkamp, Gallimard, etc., or uh, Weidefeld, 
knobs, uh, 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 there was a label of quality related to it. You know, it was published by X or Y, etc. Um, publishing houses now have enormous uh, 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 problems, also because, again, in America, but, but situation in America, Europe used to be that, that Europe was 20 years behind and now we are only two years behind, right? In America, what disappeared in America are the independent bookshops. There, are, there used to be more than 5,000, now there are less than 50. Less than 50 independent bookshops. Borders, Borders is already gone, Barnes & Noble is on the collapse. Which also means that for a publisher, you know, with the independent bookshops, they knew if we publish a good book, at least we can sell 3,000 copies to those. That's no longer the case. Now, with the merger between uh, a Random House and Penguin, um, you know, it, it, it all was an, an, it, it was an, 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 um, a, a very famous editor, Elizabeth Sifton, the wife of Fritz Stern, uh, the daughter of Reinhold Niebuhr. I mean, she was she's the grand old lady of American publishing. Uh, once I talked about uh, a certain book, and she said, Rob, I absolutely love this book. I would love to publish it. But I'm not in a position to decide. Marketing people will decide. Marketing people are now making the big decisions. They have to smell, can we sell, you know, five, ten thousand copies? If, not, if that's not the case, it's gone. We will not publish it. Now, of course, you know, with new technology, you know, everybody can publish a book, you know, everybody can have it printed. There are now uh, uh, pros and politics in Washington, there is a printing machine, etc., etc., etc. But then, you know, yeah, but, 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 then, but, but, but then the question is, you know, how to find the best books? You know, it's, it's, like, it's like the Mediterranean. There are too many of them. So again, you know, it brings down to if, if, if we see how, the basic, my, my main worry, now I'm also worried, is we see a collapse of a cultural infrastructure. We invest everything in economics, science, technology, and it's all important, I'm not against it, and it's all wonderful, whatever. But we are losing our cultural infrastructure. Now, how can we possibly think that, we, that, that as a civilized society we can survive without a cultural infrastructure? That's completely impossible. Okay. Well, uh, I, I have a lot to say on that, but I won't uh, no, say, say, Well, say. no, no, no. I mean, I think that we, we want to give a chance to, uh, to other people. But I, I, have sent, I sent you the essay I did on the, on the summit of the book and how the formats and the sales structure will change, but the book will remain. But anyway, let's hear any, any other colleagues who yes. want to interview. Yes, Dr. Lerfan. I'm continuing, continuing my conversation with you when we, we, was now, we, we were drinking some coffee now. We were speaking about a very important point uh, related to the difference between culture in West and culture in East. And uh, this is uh, a sort of uh, geographic differentiation between East and West. And when we try to find some uh, common relationship between us, as Dr. Ismail said, Europe dominated the world along the last 500 years. But uh, it was a sort of colonial domination. They affected the culture of the different countries. And most of the countries changed their culture to be European by any way. But let me go immediately to certain points you have said in your uh, excellent lecture. The role of intellectuals in developed and developing countries. And uh, we now badly need to know each other and to strengthen the relations between each other. Dr. Ismail said now that we know a little about the civilization of uh, Southeastern Asia and Korea and so on and so uh, This is a sort of uh, a, a worldly knowledge, but let us concentrate on our local knowledge. Even, even our country, we, we, we need to know each other in the Middle East. We need to know each other even in the same country. Our Sudanese friends or our brothers in the Sudan say, we know everything about Egypt, but you in Egypt 
do, do a little about our, our life in the Sudan. For this reason, to know each other, this is a very important point. How to uh, real, realize and how to come to this point, this is our, another uh, burden of the intellectuals. When, when we look at our societies here, we ask ourselves, as professors, as intellectuals, as any cultural person, what can we do in a society faces a huge problems to, uh, to, to raise the quality of life? This is a sort of, in certain cases, this is a sort of, uh, of luxury in the society, facing poverty, facing problems uh, of, of, of life as a whole. Yeah. And this is related to a very important point, uh, uh, Dr. Rob, related to the political system in every society. It depends on the political system of every society. Uh, for example, in certain Arab countries, the rate of illiteracy is very high. And when we uh, speak about illiteracy, we don't mean the alphabetical illiteracy. We mean the illiteracy as a whole, you see, in everything, in culture, in, in reading, and in writing, and everything like that. If the political system favor this uh, point, uh, I think it will raise the standard of culture in the same country. And as you know, we are trying now in our Arab uh, spring we are to, to, to develop our life, but we are facing many problems related to, to the past or even to the present. But uh, always I say to myself, we have spent a lot of time, but we are not looking to the future. We are looking to the past, not to putting a map, road map to the future. This is a very important point. And uh, always, uh, always, Shershela uh, Tit, uh, look at the president, look at the, uh, the, the government, look at those who are responsible of, uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of supporting uh, education, for example. You know that the principal problem of our society it, as a development society is education. And this is very important. Education, I said, I was astonished to hear from you that the, uh, the standard of education in the States is, is low, let us so. And uh, I do agree with you that the, 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 the super university, the states are, do, are dominating the life. They say, I'm Harvard, I am Princeton, I am so and so. But how about the rest of the, of the, of the universities? We cannot say that in, the, in Egypt, because there is our society, our universities, more or less the same, the standard is the same. And if we go through the analysis of our education system, this is a whole history, a very big story. Let us, this is irrelevant now to our point. But I always say that the, the political system is very important as this is the responsibility of the, the, the political system from the early beginning of, of the government. Last point, I always say to myself, that there is a big gap now. When I, 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 I encourage my student to read a book, he say to me, I can't go to the internet and print any point about uh, anything you want. And you know, print, and he brings uh, his, the essay, in 15 or 20 uh, pages. Uh, he didn't, uh, he didn't uh, uh, write anything with his uh, mentality. And little by little, he is enslaved by these equipments. And little by little, he will, uh, he will uh, be uh, uh, just give me, yeah, just uh, immediately between me and between the internet, for example. And this is very important point to the. As, as you said, we have a mission. We, have, uh, we must be a guide for our societies. Uh, and it depends on the, the geographical field of your society, if you are a professor, if you are uh, uh, NGO responsible, and so on and so on. And uh, another point, we go to immediately to the publishing of the books. We face this problem in, in our country. When you publish a book, you find many obstacles. And uh, uh, according to my knowledge, if you uh, have a book uh, uh, published in the States or in the UK, it is a very yeah, high standard publishing, and very good at the colored uh, charts and colored maps. But uh, uh, the Indian copy is uh, a very poor copy. And I was speaking about the copies here in Egypt. It is, 
for this reason, how can we uh, find a solution to this bad equation? I would like to, uh, to, to, to give my student a very high quality of books, printed books, with color maps, but I'm unable because uh, the standard of uh, uh, the students cannot pay for, very expensive for the students to, to pay uh, $50 for a book or something like that. Even we are now trying to find a solution for the students. Uh, especially for the mass students of the university, Alexander University, 120,000, for example. Uh, another point, we face a problem of intellectual property. You see, uh, if we go to a publisher, he will say, yes, okay, I can publish this book for you. And if you, go, if you are going to use it as a reference in the university, how much you will pay for me? And how much I pay for you? This is always a financial problem uh, facing uh, uh, those. But let me, this is the final uh, word, let me uh, be uh, 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 optimist for the future, uh, for Alexandria at least, for a library of Alexandria, because as uh, Dr. Ismail said, yes, we are doing our best to make the BA, Bibliotheque of Alexandria, uh, a universal, not a university, universal for the whole Middle East and for the Mediterranean. And I think this will happen. This will happen, and now, as you know, we are, struggling against those who would like to return to history, to ban, and we are doing our best to, uh, to make awareness of the importance of this Bibliotheca Alexandrina in our society. Anyhow, I would like to thank you again for all this I have said, and thanks for your remarks. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vata. I, I propose uh, that Rabbi, you take notes and we'll take a few comments and then come back to you so to have maximum uh, participation. We'll go to Sahar, and then, I don't know, Huda, and then to Amir, and uh, we'll go that way. I see Damia, or, oh my God, okay, lots of people want to say something. So, okay, we'll go. So I'm going up. to be very yes, brief. Please be brief. And yes, I'll be brief, uh, but I just want to start with an introduction that each person in his or her own specialization feels that the salvation of humanity and the planet is in what they do. Like environmentalists will believe if only people were environmentally co uh, conscious, the world would be a much better place. And as a student of literature, I too believe that if only people read more literature, we would all change for the better. Uh, my question is, uh, listening to comments from around the table, I see that uh, people are concerned about the future of publishing, yes. and uh, Dr. Siragiddin has also given us a very interesting lecture on the future of books and the form that books will take, etc. But I'm wondering about the future of readership, and I'm worried because, as you were saying, you know, with Facebook and Twitter and so on, people's concentration span is really shortening, and I wonder whether they will go on reading books, you, you talk to us about the length, you know, and I just wonder if, you know, people will, will read philosophy in future, things like that, that's all, thank you. Uh, again, as I said, I am uh, a technocrat. So basically, uh, when I was a student, I was a stu studying electrical engineering, during that time, uh, I was a member of uh, the IEEE, uh, Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers, and uh, in the 70s, we had 31 different transactions in electrical engineering. Today, they are 127, which means that in electrical engineering alone, you have 127 different subspecialities. Uh, this brings me to the very important point that you mentioned about um, producing, uh, a university producing uh, an all-rounder, uh, a, a person who is cultured. Uh, maybe uh, we will quote Blaise Pascal who said uh, science without a conscience is but ruin of the soul. So you need technocrats with uh, uh, some, some uh, huh? soul. And, uh, of course, uh, uh, as engineers, we're, we tend to be very square. So the best you can do is produce a square with rounded corners. This is, I think, uh, the utmost you can do uh, for, for uh, education system because uh, uh, the value system of society does not encourage the, the, the young uh, student who is out to compete 
and get his degree and so on, to delve into tangents in humanities and so on. Uh, but we uh, certainly believe that it is an essential part of forming uh, uh, a technocrat. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm looking at it from a very narrow perspective. And this is why I would like to your, your input in this, because uh, uh, it is a dilemma, actually, and it is deeply rooted in the value system. Uh, the second uh, comment I have is that books are the medium or the, uh, the way you disseminate knowledge, uh, mostly now. Uh, the book has not changed since the time uh, they were first invented and Gutenberg made uh, the, the publishing or the printing industry uh, so common and widespread. So we are now, we have all, most of the tools that we need to transform the face of books. Uh, E-books, rich content. Uh, there you can go on tangents very easily without really sacrificing pages or trees or environment or whatever. It's just the medium of disseminating the knowledge that needs to be very carefully evaluated today because uh, the technology is almost there, but the critical mass is not there, and the publishing industry has such a big uh, uh, inertia uh, that to change their business model and how they make money on books uh, will take really a revolutionary uh, uh, action. Uh, maybe you can uh, elaborate on that. About the political uh, 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 system, um, I couldn't agree more. I mean, obvious, and, 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 uh, uh, as old as mankind, uh, uh, um, it's about government and politics and policy. Uh, yesterday, I allowed myself to remark that uh, 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 one of the curses of, of our, 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 our present time is that our elites, which is larger than just the political elite, but that in my perception the elites are the problem, um, because they are uh, uh, ex exemplifying this, this, this paradigm, and therefore the elites, they will not change. It, it will have to come bottom up. It has to come from all kinds of different sources. Um, What the elites, the political elite foremost, should understand is um, something uh, John Pollack and I got from uh, uh, a novel by Marguerite Yusenaar, uh, Les Mémoires d'Adrienne, The Memories of Emperor Adrianus, which, which is a beautiful book. Anyway, it was an, 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 at a certain moment, Marguerite Yusenaar has the emperor to reflect on his duty as an emperor. And then he realizes that, that it is his duty as an emperor to take care for everything and everybody who is vulnerable. Now, if our governments would understand that they are there to protect everybody and everything that is vulnerable, which includes poor people, ill people, uh, disabled. disabled, but also strangers, but also the environment, but also culture, yes. because culture is vulnerable. Again, this awareness, unfortunately, by too many of them, there are exceptions, but by too many of them is no longer there. You're there to govern. You, we, we give you a certain power. You have a certain power to protect everything and everybody who's vulnerable. Now. But again, the intellectuals do have a certain play, role to play in the sense that you, know, you can go to every civilization uh, and every religion and there are always the priests, the scribes, and the prophets. Now, we are part of the scribe culture. Um, and there are always priests and there will be scribes, but where are the prophets? even the prophets without honor. And, 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 and I think we should, we, we, we should have the courage again to be a little bit more of a prophet and speak the truth. 
Because as intellectuals, there are many things we do not, we cannot do because we don't have power. But the one thing we can do and should do is speak truth to power. And we're not doing it most of the time. Because, you know, we may lose our subsidy or uh, we will not make a promotion or what will happen to my position, etc., etc., etc. Now, when we do that, and then there is the next thing to be uh, uh, done, and this is this this is this whole setting around the internet, etc., etc. Um, with the Nexus Institute, we, we just organised a conference entitled "How to Change the World." Because when I give my lectures or my talks, you know, too often people come to me and say, "Well, you know, how how can we change the world?" And I thought, "Well, that's a very good question. Let's organise a conference." This is your strategy as well. Oh, that's a good question. Let's, you know, let's have a meeting about it. And so we organized this conference, and I, had, I, I thought I had a wonderful lineup. I had a very orthodox Maoist like Alain Badiou, you know, who still believes in Mao, etc., etc., etc. I have Agnes Heller, uh, who was a student of, of, of Lukács. She, she, she was started a communist. She's no longer a communist. I had the vice president of, of, of a big uh, uh, advertisement company who was my true capitalist, etc., etc. But I also had Yevgeny Morozov. Yevgeny Morozov is only 28. He's a student still at Harvard. And uh, uh, three years ago, he became world famous with his book, The Net Delusion. He came from the world of Google. He came from the world of Facebook. He lived there in Silicon uh, uh, Valley. And he came to realize that it is nonsense utterly nonsense to think that internet and the kind of values it incarnate will change politics, will change the world. He's, he, it, when you read the book, it's very convincing that's not the case. And there are now more books coming out. Also, you know, we now know that with, with Facebook, privacy is gone. Everything, ev you know, what, what you put there will be there for eternity. Privacy is gone. But also, a, a great psychologist, as, as Sherry Turkle, did ser serious research at MIT, and she found out that for many, many uh, uh, young people, the, the whole internet culture, Facebook, etc., etc., makes it impossible for them to express their emotions. They can no longer write letters. They can no longer make a phone call. It's too dangerous. They will feel too vulnerable for it. And uh, then there is also the, the, uh, 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 the research that and, and you mentioned that, uh, uh, Saha, about indeed uh, the constant stimuli by the iPhone, the email, or whatever, is disrupting our concentration span. And some research claims, I do not know, but, but claims that, that, that you can also see a kind of neurological consequence of it. So, then again, you know, you cannot stop this technology. It would be foolish to try to stop the technology, but the question is how to deal with it, you know, how, how to deal with it in a wise uh, 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 way. Um, which brings me to, 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 to your questions, I mean, about uh, 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 technology and the further specialization, etc., etc., etc. Well, of course, well, we do know that the progress of technology is related to this super specialization, etc., 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 and we also know that most of uh, 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 you know specialists in science cannot even talk about their own specialty with the other specialists because it's a different specialty, etc., etc., etc. And you're also completely right that our value system now is a value system which is not an encouragement. Uh, uh, you know, to deal with the humanities, uh, uh, literature, etc., etc., etc. So, to, how to how to get beyond this point? Well, one related to your remark, I mean that, that every specialist thinks that his or her specialization will save the world. We know that that's not true because, for the very simple reason, that there is one thing more important than knowledge, which is wisdom. And wisdom is also about, well, it's, it's always, it's not specialist knowledge, that's one thing, whatever it is, and it is about how to put things in practice. It is about values and virtues. That's one thing. The second thing is, this is, we, we, we talk, spoke about it yesterday, and, and uh, about this great classic of, of, of Robert Pershing's and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. The question is, how to preserve quality? What is quality? Because with the, the ongoing technologization of our society is on a dead end. 
that will not protect the quality of our life. We need something more. So, in short, and it's all wisdom, but we have to get out of our paradigm. We have to question the things we take for granted. We have to question our political system, our, uh, uh, how we organize our knowledge, etc., 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 and to get back to, to the big basic question, how to protect you know, the dignity of life. What makes life worth living? And then, you know, what kind of knowledge do we need? You know, what kind of wisdom uh, do we need? What, what can we do with the instruments we have? Thank you, Rob. No. This side, Lamia, and then uh, Noha, and then Nagla, and Nagarek. Then the second round, I'll come back to the transverse. We'll go first, Lamia, and then uh, Noha. Uh, I have two things to say, and maybe they contradict each other. The first thing, as a librarian, when he talked about organizing the books uh, on the shelves, um, I had a discussion with Dr. Sradedin a few days ago. Uh, you made me go back to my textbooks and see how, how it works. So there's, there's you're a category for miscellaneous where you can put the, the, the <laughs> Nexus journal where it doesn't fit into any of the other <laughs> It will be the most interesting show. Yeah, you're right about what you said. We keep doing things the way it has been done. So we are still using things, that, that using the standards that have been set centuries ago, the Library of Congress standards and the Dewey. But looking into my book, the first part is talking about this, but the rest, talking about the change, but the change comes in the online and the digital. Organize, how to organize the information to make it more accessible, to interlink different uh, disciplines together by using ontologies, taxonomies, and that's and how to organize the information. So there's a change, but not physically. The other thing that I want to say, uh, you mentioned that the deterioration of the um, of the culture infrastructure, and you brought up the uh, Amazon um, and the self. Uh, authoring and self-publishing. This is one of the arguments that the publishers say. Well, the new technologies gave us so many tools for searching and finding the information easier and giving us more access to the information. But about the quality, well, that's what the publishers say. To publish a book, it takes so many steps until it gets published to ensure the quality, the art of writing, and even the uh, the same thing goes for the journalism, the profession. There are, I read many articles about the professionalism of, of the journalism. It's, it's deteriorating. The art of writing, because they know they are running out of business, and now the online journals are mostly online, and it has to be updated regularly. So the speed and time is, is very important in that. So even the, the journalists, they are not following the standards of the previous print uh, journals. So is it the technology? Is it the quality? What is it? Yes. The art of making meaning less meaningful. I, 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 I really like this. And the importance of connections are part of the role of the intellectual as a guard, as a guide now. Do you think this is possible today? This is possible to, to do today. Well, all trends goes toward specialization and sub-specialities. With, with, with this attitude, the intellectual will be able to, able to, to connect with other, or, he, or he, he will lose totally the communication. Uh, if we take the, the, the example of a reference book with many, with many topics, uh, each and every one take the topic, the, the, does not read the whole book. We read only the topic we want. And even with the, uh, the example of the, we take the, the French literature, for example, the, the, the sentence, the syntax even of the, the, the most known uh, uh, authors today are, are short, are depending on silence, uh, and it had, it, it, it evolved, it, it, uh, it uh, changed today. And even they, they let a free space for the reader himself to, to follow, to understand, following his, his special path. 
So the, the intellectual, by, by being a guide uh, of, with connect, uh, by trying to connect all the, the, the disciplines, the, the, he will, I think he will lose the, the, the communi communicability. Thank you. Uh, I was wondering about uh, the big questions that are asked everywhere, and I was thinking maybe these big questions have different answers in different parts of the world. Therefore, create they, the answers would create different worldviews. And I was wondering, uh, do you see these worldviews as uh, like clashing with each other, or would you see any kind of like harmony or kind of agreement or kind of at least kind of understanding between these different worldviews. Thank you. Well, I, uh, first I have something funny concer concerning the uh, publishing of, uh, the quality of publishing, you know, uh, 1996 I published a book in one of the very outstanding uh, publishers in, in England, uh, Arson Phillips. Uh, and uh, when one of uh, the scholars reviewed my book, he uh, blamed them concerning the, uh, my name, uh, because in the cover, you know, they put El Sadi with hyphen, and in the spine without hyphen, you know. So, so the, the, uh, 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 when when we compare that with what uh, what uh, Professor Abayana said, you know, the the, uh, uh, the comparison completely, uh, you know, uh, out of reach. Anyway. Uh, 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 concerning my question, uh, do you think that uh, encyclopedias, which we call them sometimes, you know, the uh, heavy uh, cultural industries, can make a sort of minimization between the differences of people all over the world? I mean, in thoughts, in uh, creed, and you know, all the differences, you know, all all th th that wouldn't help in that way. Thank you. The first two uh, questions of uh, Lamia and Noha. Um, listen, and, uh, uh, and here I relate to uh, things George Stein keep, repeat, keep repeating. I think he's right in it. One of the things we have lost is the art of reading. I mean, this is why I started with this example of this unknown uh, uh, Chinese, which, which impressed so much Hugo von Hoffmann's uh, uh, tale. Can we, can we imagine, simply imagine? I mean, we cannot even imagine it in a movie. I mean, we, if we, in a movie, it will be all hilarious or, 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 or whatever. I mean, that somebody is waiting for his death and reading a book in a very, very serious way. Um, are we still able to read? This is also my... And I, I, I think uh, we will have here a, a, a slight difference. Um, but uh, uh, the e-reader, according to most research, most people who start reading a book on the e-reader will not finish the book. They do not finish the book. And one of the reasons why they are not able to finish the book is because they are constantly interrupted. And so this is not... To read is, is a different mental state of mind. It's a different, it's, it's, you need silence, you need concentration. And I also think uh, 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 the, physical, the physical experience of having this book and a pencil next to you to make notes, whatever, um, is essential, as he's not listening. Uh, 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 no, no. One of my jokes is that, 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 that to, to read a book on an e-reader is like having sex with a sex pop. I mean, it is possible, uh, uh, apparently, uh, uh, but, but it, is, it, is, it is not real. It is not real. And so, and, and interestingly enough, you know, we, 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 we live in a world which is in many ways is becoming more and more fake. The, sec the other thing we, we probably have to acknowledge, and this is a political incorrect view, um, but let it be, is that the book always was for a minority. Always. It was always an instrument for a relatively small group of people. Then, definitely after World War II, 
uh, 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 with the uh, 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 welfare state and, and the paperback, etc., etc., we had this dream. Everybody's dream was that everybody will read book, and that the book became a mass product. Now, apparently, for most people, they have all the instruments, um, you know, to amuse themselves, and you know, the whole gadget culture, etc., etc., etc. So maybe we have to accept the simple fact that the time of big, big publishing houses, big bookstores, uh, big sales is over. Big books? Big books is over. Well, but there's an, an, yeah, but there's an, 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 we should not forget that dear friend Nietzsche was not able to publish one book himself. And yes, there was an, an, and he had to buy a publisher and then you know, he sold 25 copies. And Schopenhauer, the Welters Wille und Vorstellung, it took him 40 years before, you know, before people started to, to discover the book. I mean, we, once we did a, a, a symposium on, on greatness, and I, as I wanted to know what is great, what, what makes something great, and then you know, only tiny research will teach you that uh, Johann Sebastian Bach was recognized as a great organ player. But nobody was interested in his music. Nobody. Uh, 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 Mozart, you know, for good reasons, his grave is unknown because you know who, who the hell was this crazy guy? Listen, and, and it, it is. This is true for so many. The persona, you know, he put everything in in, in, in a trunk, and he was not interested in it. So listen, and, and we are we are so focused, you know, on the stupidity of of hypes and. Publicity and being well known, etc., etc., etc. Let me assure you that 99,999% of everything what is now known and big and great and important and celebrity will be absolutely, totally, forever forgotten. And the unknown, you know, the masterpieces we are not known yet will will come, will come. So then, uh, 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 let's educate the. Gentlemen, let's educate our elites again, because he. But not through the universities that. Well, the, 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 the universities have become dysfunctional. So, unless the, the, the universities are capable, you know, to re, to rediscover themselves, forget so how it. How do you suggest that we educate? Well, well, for example, again, there is an and 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 uh, 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 we we do still have many means. But this was. Uh, I think, Noah, you, you mentioned about uh, the role of uh, the intellectual to be a guide. Well, again, one of the horrible things and one of the stupid things of, 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 of the intellectual academic world is that they are writing in a language nobody understands. It's the footnote culture. It's about, you know, how often, you know, an, an, you are quoted in somebody else and to make sure we have the mutual admiration society, so I quote you, you quote me, which put me higher on the index, which makes me more important, etc., etc., etc. What they are writing, I cannot read it because it's unreadable. Especially the French are good at it. So, Rusen, and, 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 and here we have Schopenhauer and the Nietzsche, who rightly said, you know, if, if there is no clear writing, there is no clear thinking. Period. Period. So, who, who, who have become the public intellectuals? The public intellectuals who know, okay, yes, I know something about the world of ideas, and I think I have to, uh, and it's, it's my obligation to explain something. And then, you know, you have people like Havel or Joseph Brodsky or my friend next here, I mean, there are a few of them who, who, who know and understand what they have to do. But again, and, and I, don't take this personal in any way, but, but, but the universities are now institutes which, which do not teach people how to read or to write, and not even to think or to speak. It's, it's not the case. So there was also something uh, 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 to be done uh, 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 there. And then about uh, 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 the world views. Um, yes, of course, you know, we are all human beings. We are all, uh, uh, it was mentioned uh, yesterday, uh, 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 we are all filled with our own fears. Freud has wonderful explanations about that. Um, 
we all have our fears, we all know our resentment, anger, etc., etc., etc. We all have to deal with our uh, demons, and therefore, you know, we, we stick to a certain identity. You know, this is me, this is how I think. Blah, blah. And, and we feel comfortable when we are surrounded by people who think and act like me because, okay, now. But then we have our friend John Stuart Mill, who on, in, in On Liberty has this wonderful advice that he says, look, you know, before you even want to think, wants to think that you know the truth, the best way out is that you surround yourself with all those people who can argue against you. Let's have the arguments against your own argument all the time. And only then, when you have been able to convince the others, that, or, you know, or you're still convinced about your own argument, having listened to everything which can be said against you, okay, then you may think that you know something about the truth. And again, this is, this is the attitude of, this is why Socrates had the conversations, right? Instead of big, big lectures. And this is why we treasure and have to re-treasure. We have to get rid of globalization. We have to install cosmopolitanism and educate all our fellow human beings in, of course, your own identity is important. And of course, your own language is important. And of course, your own tradition is important. But let's try to enlarge it, right? Instead of diminish it or think that you are I mean, again, in, in Jewish culture, people, you know, the difference between human beings and trees are trees have roots and human beings legs. We can walk. So go out and walk. And again, these are not, this, this is not Einstein. This is not extremely difficult. You do not need a big education to understand these things. They are very simple, basic things which can be done but are not done because we are too lazy, too stupid, and too, too addicted to our comfortable position. Thank you. I uh, think we're coming to a close, uh, so I will uh, try to add something at the end, if I may. Uh, I, uh, of course, am delighted to uh, uh, meet up again with Rob and to listen to his wonderful mind uh, ranging over a broad range of subjects and uh, to find uh, all the points of commonalities, but also uh, to uh, find the points where we disagree so that we can engage even more. And uh, surprisingly, yesterday uh, evening, I was just saying something to Hoda, uh, which is close to what you quoted uh, J.S. Mill as saying, that it's very important to listen to the contradictory points of views before you make up your mind on anything. And it's, it's one of the fundamental things that we need to do. And regretfully, uh, we, I lived in the United States for many, many years, and I remember the time when there were only three channels on television, plus the teensy little public television channel. It's supposed to be 1900. Uh, no, no, it was the 1960s. And there were still, uh, there were no cable channels at the time, and uh, there were uh, ABC, CBS, and NBC that dominated everything. And they had something called the Fairness Doctrine, so that if they gave half an hour to the Republicans, they had to give half an hour to the Democrats. Now, the value of that, the Fairness Doctrine was abolished in the 1980s, simply because, said, well, there are many channels right now. And uh, I've heard uh, some people, like Nicholas Kristof and others, argue that, in fact, this has resulted not in a better informed public, but in a more polarized public because very few people will go to listen to uh, the channel or to read the columns of those who disagree with them. So they will go to the channel or to the columnist who reinforces their prejudices and say, yeah, right, that's exactly right. And so people who watch Fox television uh, people watch MSNBC. I mean, now it's on cables. They are clearly uh, conservative and liberal, and so they go and the talk radio is the same and so on. So in some way, surprisingly, the enormous multiplicity of opportunities that the technology has provided 
has not translated into a broadening of the perspective, which at an earlier occasion was almost forced and guaranteed by law, uh, at least on the political side. Now, it's true that opposite that, we have highly specialized channels which wouldn't exist before. Uh, I like tennis. There's a whole channel 303 in, 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 in Washington that shows nothing but tennis 24 hours a day. You like football, you can watch football. There are, uh, uh, you can watch Congress in Action through C-SPAN, uh, Discovery Channel, you have Science. You have, all these things exist. But in the fundamental issue of attitude formation, this huge menu of possibilities, the smorgasbord that was, that was offered to people has not resulted in people seeking a broader view for themselves. And that raises a question as to, yes, what did the universities do and how did they prepare them for going out into uh, life? And also, uh, I think it raises a question about whether this is a transitory phase or one that will result in a permanent situation and whether it has contributed to the, the uh, uh, polarization, for example, of American discussions. Now, uh, you and I both like George Steiner a lot. And uh, George Steiner has a beautiful little book, tiny, tiny little book, which is a series of five distinguished lectures he gave in Canada called Nostalgia for the Absolute. And what he's saying is fundamentally, and I come back to the issue that uh, Nagla raised about worldviews, is that there used to be a comprehensive worldview which was dominated, at least in Western culture, by the church for a long time. And it has been displaced after the Renaissance scientific revolution and the Enlightenment. But there is a strong nostalgia for the absolute that exists in people. And there have been other offers, so to speak, including the Freudian perspective, the structuralist perspective, the Marxian perspective, the so-called scientific perspective, which is not complete, actually. It's a very minor one. But the absence of worldviews is today particularly manifest because in many things that we are all doing, we are substituting process for product. In other words, the, the fact of engaging with a lot of people, oh my God, you know, I'm on Facebook and I have 762 friends. What quality of friendship do you have with any of them? Uh, so the, just the fact that I can communicate to all these people substitutes for the nature of the communication, the content of the communication, the quality of the communication, and uh, we are losing some of that. But I tend to be an optimist, and I would like to end on an optimistic note. And the optimistic note that I would like to end with is really that we have three or four things to look forward to. The first of these is that we are in a transitory period, but where the, the shock of going from a world where stability was the presumed, def to use the current parlance, the presumed default position, which we learn from computer language. In other words, that this is the nature of things is to be stable, and that change is something that is different, to a world where change is absolutely the common denominator and is going faster. And if you live in a world like that, then your worldview will have to change. And it is not through the substitution of a worldview that was organized around stability by another worldview organized around stability that you will be able to cope with change. And thus, I think that the, the worldview that will emerge in the future will uh, have to be invented by uh, the young people who are born into this culture. My grandson, uh, I'm very fond of that story, is when he was about this high, he says to me, can I borrow your, your, your mobile phone? And I was surprised. I said, of course, dear, do you want to call someone? He says, no. 
I want to play games. And I said, this is my, my cell phone. He hasn't seen my cell phone before. He says, I said, there are games on the cell phone? He says, sure, let me show you. This little six-year-old kid, you know. See, 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 see all these games. But they held it. I mean, they live in a different culture. They were brought up with all of this. They are thinking differently. And uh, yes, uh, we are unhappy. We, with our standards of, of, of uh, 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 discourse, presentation, logic, etc., are unhappy with their, uh, their, their language abilities. We are unhappy with their, their attention spans and so on. But as I quoted in my lecture on, uh, on, uh, that I gave at the summit of the book, every generation has been saying the next generation will be a disaster. And I quoted Hesiod, who in 700 BC said, you know, my God, the world is going to be destroyed when this generation gets in charge. Well, you know, 700 BC, we've been around for quite a while. We've done a lot of things since then. Sure, we've had world wars and other disasters, but we've also done a lot of good things including Bach and Mozart and, uh, and uh, Nietzsche and others. So uh, I think that uh, we are in a period of very profound change. And uh, I, like Rob, disagree with the idea of globalization equals homogenization. Uh, and I do, uh, as you all know from my uh, other uh, fora and speeches, believe in cosmopolitanism and the diversity of life as an enriching force in culture just as much as in ecology. But I also uh, believe very much that not only is technology unstoppable, but that it is the function of those who are consider themselves in some way or another responsible for culture, custodians of culture, servants of culture, servants of the institutions that support culture, museums, publishing, libraries, uh, uh, universities, uh, coffee shops, uh, all of that, that we have a primary uh, responsibility to, uh, to address uh, uh, the issue of the technology uh, with an enabling perspective, meaning that uh, we have to take for granted that uh, Whatever the future is going to be, it's going to be extremely different from the present. And probably we cannot predict it. Because a little bit of humility would say, who of us 20 years ago would have predicted what the internet would do? Who of us 10 years ago would have predicted that Facebook would have more than a billion people? Who of us even six, seven years ago would have predicted Twitter? and the reach that Twitter has. Well, if we couldn't predict that 20 and 10 years ago, how we should have the humility to say we cannot predict 20 years from now or 10 years from now. But, and this is where I rejoin Rob completely, our job vis-a-vis -vis the younger generation is not just to educate them about the classics and why they are classics and they will rediscover them, is to instill the values the values that are essential because of all the terrors and, and horrors that human history has shown us, we always come back that there are these enlightened values that make us human and that this should not be lost either by those who, like uh, uh, Colonel Bryant uh, said, uh, those who, who uh, worship at the altar of conformity or those who worship at the altar of technology may lose sight of. And then having passed on, said this is our gift to you, let them fly and see what they will do. And the world will be theirs because we will be gone and they will invent their own world with their own technology of their own time and I'm optimistic enough to believe that it's not going to be all that bad. But Rob and I are also among the, probably the very last generation who will do this. And so 
where the last generation who actually uses fountain pens. <laughs> he does. Just talking about so it. I thought that most appropriate for your visit to us in the Library of Alexandria would be a special gift to remind you of this visit and hopefully to assist you in writing up the lectures you gave here. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you all. to what you said in, in, in the English Parliament they would say here, here. You know, in those two words. Thank you so much. It was a great privilege.